we're back. <laughs> Hi, my name is Markus Schwalek and I work as a software developer at the Machine Networks Department of the Kauf Group. The company developed an Internet of Things platform focused primarily on transporting solutions and uses Apache Cassandra for sorting and processing messages coming in from various devices like trains, cars and trams. Uh, in June, I took part in organizing the Zagreb of Cassandra Users Meetup and I gave a talk there about Cassandra Time Series in combination with the Node.js and Arduino. This talk is going to explain you how Cassandra handles the big amounts of data the modern information systems have to deal with. So, before going into the inner workings of Cassandra, let me present you some of the numbers that describe Cassandra's scalability. Now, in the Fortune 100, 25% of the companies use Apache Cassandra. The biggest installation around currently is the one from Apple. It has over 75,000 nodes and holds over 10 petabytes of data. The installation handling the most requests in day is the one from Apple Netflix. <laughs> it handles over 1 trillion requests per day and it is often promoted as being one of the greatest Cassandra success stories. Uh, this success story has a lot to do with the company called the Datastax. Datastax has its own enterprise-grade commercial Apache Cassandra distribution and provides training and support for it. Uh, Datastax was also very kind to provide the t-shirts for the audience and I'll give them away after the talk with a simple first-come, first-suit principle. Now, <laughs> although, although Cassandra is pretty serious and scalable technology, from my personal point of view, it also has the fun part to it. Now, I managed to install the Cassandra on my Android TV box at home, and I hooked it up with a little bit of Arduino and Node.js, and I started to measure the light levels and the temperature near my window. Uh, one evening, there was a storm, so I immediately went into the data to see what's going on. <laughs> and the spikes on the graphs, on the graph, are actually lightning strikes. <laughs> so my improvised Cassandra-powered indoor weather station turned itself into a lightning detector, just like that. <laughs> so, uh, now Cassandra is really fast at writing, and it allows you to gather data even when you don't know what you're going to do with it yet, kind of like I do. So, <laughs> now, before going into the inner workings of Cassandra, let's explain some of the theory behind it. So, in the year 2000, Eric Brewer published the Cup Theorem. Uh, this theorem states that every distributed system can simultaneously provide just two out of three guarantees. The guarantees are shown as vertices on a triangle and the possible choices are sort of shown like circles. Next to the possible choice is also an example of a solution that delivers those uh, guarantees. Now, let's start with the guarantee of consistency. The guarantee of consistency states that every node within a group of nodes gets the data from the most recent right. The guarantee of availability states that every running node responds to a query regardless of if it has the most recent data or not. The guarantee of partition tolerance <coughs> states that the system continues to operate despite network outages or message failures. So, with the Cassandra, the choice is more towards uh, availability. We have the examples of the other solutions, for instance, Monga is more towards consistency. Now, consistent system have to wait for the information to propagate through all of the nodes. And the systems oriented toward availability, they kind of respond without, with whatever data they have at the moment. So, now, with the Cassandra, as I said, the choice is more towards availability. Now, how does Cassandra even distribute the data? I mean, uh, there's no master node in Cassandra. So, all of the nodes in the system use the following technique. It's called consistent hashing. But what do we do with it? Cassandra distributes the data in a way that every row gets assigned to a node. Now, this is done with the help of a hash function. Now, let's imagine that we have a simple hash function that hashes to only 100 values. And 
Now, if we take the row key and make a hash out of this row key, this returns us a number. If we partition the possible output of the hash function to sections that belong to node, we can easily find out to which node a row belongs. Now, in our example, the first 25s go to the node A, the next 25 to the node B, and so on. In a distributed system, we will often need to copy the data just in the case that the node fails. Now, we'll again use this ring, and we'll go around the number of times that we need uh, the data to get stored. So, for instance, if we wanted two copies for the node C, we would just make a replica to the node D and A. Now, in reality, having 100 values is probably not enough. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> now, okay, Cassandra actually uses a member 3 hash algorithm. It has a slightly larger range than 100. But on the previous slide, the ranges were partitioned manually. And this is how Cassandra was doing it before. But in practice, this often led to various kinds of errors and inconsistencies and whatever. Now, the Cassandra engineers then thought of the following. Okay, we'll let every node pick its marker on the range. And we would have a situation similar to this. Now, one thing that we noticed right away is, okay, this division is not really fair because the node D, D got a lot more data than the node C did. But how do we go around this? Okay, to make the distribution more fair, well, we can let every node pick multiple markers. And in practice, uh, this leads to the situation as shown here. The whole range partitioned into, uh, yeah, as it's shown in the slide. So every node gets to pick 256 markers in Cassandra by default. If some nodes are more performant, you can assign them a greater number of tokens. They would, statistically speaking, have a greater chance of becoming responsible for more data. If you look up the Cassandra documentation, this technique of partitioning the data is called virtual nodes. Now, the markers that the node picks, the question is, how does this, even, this information even come to the other nodes? Because they're picked randomly by the members of the cluster. The answer to this is by using the gossip protocol. Now, gossip protocol mimics the behavior seen in uh, social networks, or for instance, sometimes it is called uh, epidemic control, because it resembles the way a virus spreads in a biological community. There are three steps to gossip. The third step is optional. So in the first node, first uh, step, the node contacts a random live node. In the second step, the node checks a random down node. And in the third optional step, it contacts a seed node. Now, uh, the seed node have no special uh, treatment in Cassandra whatsoever. They are there to start the gossip interaction as fast as possible. And when configuring a cluster, the, administra the administrator picks a couple of relatively stable nodes. Now, Let's take a step back, because now we know how the data is partitioned, and we know how the clients communicate, not the clients, but the no, nodes, sorry. And now let's take a step back and have a look at how the client actually accesses the cluster. I mean, the client can query any node in the cluster. It doesn't really matter to what node request is sent. Now, the client also says what consistency level it wants. So after contacting the coordinated node, it says, okay, it's fine. I mean, just return me the first data you find. Okay, that's a perfectly valid situation. In some cases, we'll want a better consistency, and then we can have, we can set a higher level consistency per request. The most common one is electing a quorum. So quorum is, uh, a number that we get from this formula. So if some data is replicated three times, it's division by two, one and a half, plus one, one and two and a half, so th two. Yeah. <laughs> it's a round down, as you can see. So uh, the after the me, now let's move to the right path. 
So in Cassandra, uh, two things need to be done before the data is written, the considered to be written. The first one is to write it to the commit log. The commit log is the part that takes the longest because, because it accesses the disk. So in Cassandra, the data is always appended at the end of the commit log, and this avoids random seeking on the disk. The second part is writing the data to a memory. Uh, this is done in the structure called the mem table. The mem table stores the data in memory. Uh, when the mem table reaches a configured limit, it is flushed to the disk to a structure called the SS table. Now, the mem table content is not changed at all when it is saved to the disk. Now, you might be wondering, okay, but some data gets changed from time to time, some data, data gets deleted. Now, there's a process called compaction to deal with all this. During the compaction, uh, there are three phases in the compaction. In the first phase, the data, old and irrelevant data, is removed. In the second phase, the data marked with the tombstone is also removed. Now, you might wonder what the tombstone is. Well, it's a distributed system. So, if we simply deleted a record out of the database, the other nodes might actually think that this node missed a write. So, therefore, we are just marking the data with a tombstone so that the other nodes know that this data got deleted. So, in this second, second phase, we are moving the tombstone data out. And in the final phase, we consolidate the data, we rebuild the indexes again. Uh, this pretty much concludes the writing of the data. Now, let's move to reading the data out of the Cassandra. One important probabilistic data structure that is used here is the Bloom filter. Now, there's some theory behind it, but in short, let's imagine that we have a 12 bits long uh, Bloom filter. Now, we can hash uh, the values and let's imagine that the value that's going to be placed in set is hashed with only three bits. And now those values are represented in one. And then we will fill the filter with the values A, B, and C. Now, if we wanted to check if the value is in the filter, for instance, some value D, we would check it on the third bit, or on the sixth bit, and then look up on the 11th bit, there's no data. So, okay, the D is probably not in there. There's a little catch with this moon filter because the bits are shared, as you can see. So sometimes the boom filter will, will return, okay, it's in there, when it in fact isn't. This is called a false positive. Now, the, before, uh, if the data is not found in the memory, it gets read from the SS table. Every SS table has this boom filter, so Cassandra can be really fast at checking if the row is in the SS table or not. There's also a component called key cache, which stores the position of the rows on the disk. Uh, if the row is not found in the key cache, the position is approximated with various calculations, and this includes random disk seeking. Now, we've covered the whole reading, writing cycle with the Cassandra. Now let's talk a bit about the data organization in the Cassandra. At the highest level, we have the key space. Inside the key space, there are tables. tables have rows and rows have, have columns, pretty standard. So uh, let's have a look at how the Cassandra uh, manages all those data organization elements in the Cassandra query language. Now, when doing any kind of work, we have to create the key spaces. Key spaces regulate the replication factor. Uh, if you remember the earlier partitioning ring, the uh, replication factor is simply a number of copies that are going to be placed on the nodes in the cluster. So we can define it simply or we can define it per data center, as shown in the last video. Now, the, if we will want to do any kind of work, we'll also have to define tables. This looks pretty similar to the SQL, doesn't it? So, <laughs> inserting the data is also pretty standard, so nothing new there. But with the update, there's a slight difference. Because Cassandra actually allows inserting the data with the same primary key again. 
So actually, auditing the data in Cassandra is sometimes considered to be an anti-pattern. It's actually faster to just insert the new data again. But there's also a slight catch to it because there's no auditing of primary key fields. Now, the delete statement, also pretty similar to the SQL, but the real difference is under the hood, where the data is just marked with a tombstone. Now, select, yeah, nothing special here, but uh, Cassandra usually loads the data just by some primary key, and then the data usually has to be filtered at the application level. Now, the app support is also pretty good with the Cassandra, over 15 languages supported, and here's an example of how to use the Cassandra with the Node.js. Uh, there's just a simple reading of data, and yeah, that's about it. Uh, this concludes the talk, and now I'd like to open the Q&A session. Actually, storing it. So, uh, 
joints are not supported in that sense. As I said it before, primary key plus some sort of uh, some sort of uh, checking of the clustering problems, but that's really internal. So in essence, uh, Cassandra can be thought of as a key value store. You have some key, get the data, that's it. Yeah. Next question. Uh, can you show me comment on why observing is preferred to updating? So. Uh, when I talked it, about it a little bit earlier, perhaps you can remember that data is stored in the mem table. And the second part is actually when the mem table gets too big, it gets stored to the SS table in the disk. So actually, absurdly, places this data into memory immediately. So there's no uh, seeking or whatever. You just have the US data dead in the memory, and then you use the compaction to move the data with the time. So, yeah. Uh, you said that uh, the, the Cassandra query language is uh, really limited. Uh, do we have to use it? Uh, in the sense that, uh, is there another way to use yes, it? Yes, there, uh, there's actually a CLI, a uh, command line interface tool. To be honest, I didn't use it that much because I started to work with the Cassandra when the CQL became a pretty popular form of interacting with the database. So, but there are other ways, and I use it in some works that this CLI tool when I wanted to see how the data is really laid out on the lowest level. So it's pretty useful there. Also, I had some trouble with uh, sometimes it is hard to access the binary data or something like that. So CLI is uh, still a bit better there, but uh, the data stacks and the Cassandra community tries to uh, push the CQ CQL as much as possible. Yeah. Next. We have time for another question. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, okay, three t-shirts.